On its face, Celeste seems like a fairly simple game about climbing a mountain. You play the role of Madeline, a young woman who sets herself the goal of scaling Mount Celeste. Over the course of the game, however, it becomes apparent that the literal events are largely an allegory for the internal struggles that Madeline goes through. It's fair to say that the use of climbing a mountain as a metaphor for overcoming challenges is nothing new. Hell, another game with that very premise was released around the same time. But Celeste's meditations on the nature of anxiety and how those with mental illness cope are some of the most nuanced and thoughtful I have ever seen. So I've decided today to examine some of the ways that this marvelous game explores its themes. The early stage of the game doesn't yet go too deep into the specific nature of Madeline's anxieties, instead letting you as the player get accustomed to the gameplay and become intimately familiar with the insane difficulty of this game. While there are brief hints at Madeline's mental state in Chapter 1, for the most part the game is focused on priming you with the intense frustration of failure. It's not uncommon for a first-time player to die over a hundred times in the first level alone. After all that struggle, Chapter 1 concludes with Madeline remarking something that you surely must be thinking yourself at this point. This might have been a mistake. Chapter 2 begins the gradual descent into Madeline's psyche. After exploring this somewhat open level for a while, you discover a mirror from which a reflection of Madeline's fears and anxieties break free. She represents everything Madeline doesn't like about herself, and she urges Madeline to give up on her climb up the mountain. While this part of Madeline is not actually evil, I will be referring to her as Battleline for the rest of this video because it's easier than saying part of Madeline a hundred times, and also because it's hilarious. After unsuccessfully trying to convince Madeline to give up, Battleline chases her down to stop her. Madeline rejects Battleline as truly being a part of herself and runs away, literally running from her fears. After escaping from Battleline and getting a call from some unnamed person from her past, Madeline eventually realizes that this was all a dream, and wakes up right where you ended Chapter 1. Your real trek through the ruins is much calmer, presenting no obstacles, no actual difficulty. When you build up a problem in your head, it can often turn out to be simpler in reality than you had imagined. The chapter ends with Madeline deciding to call her mom, a small bit of comfort for what had been a very stressful night for her. It's worth noting that the issues that Madeline faces are not the only ones the game touches on. Up to this point, the player has also seen how fellow traveler Theo is slightly obsessed with his social media presence, not necessarily to an unhealthy degree, but certainly enough to warrant some self-reflection. Similarly, Chapter 3 is almost wholly dedicated to examining the mental state of the slightly less-than-living hotel manager, Oshiro. Oshiro is stuck in a self-perpetuating feedback loop, where he's so overwhelmed by his work that he keeps putting it off, leading to more work piling up, causing him to feel more overwhelmed, and so on. He feels like it's his duty to take care of the work he has put off, and is ashamed of the fact that he needs other people's help to lessen his enormous workload. This breeds a degree of self-hatred within him, and he derides himself for his shortcomings regularly. His self-loathing literally spawns new obstacles to overcome. While this chapter plays a fairly small role in the overall story, I think it's very valuable in recognizing how people experience their anxieties in different ways, and the unique ways that one's mental state can breed a toxic mindset within those who suffer from it. Also of note is the fact that chapter 3 is really goddamn hard. Chapter 3 introduces a huge difficulty spike in an already very difficult game. While the story side of the chapter is focused on getting you into Oshiro's headspace, the gameplay side of the chapter is working overtime on making you intimately familiar with just how impossible this mountain climb feels to Madeline. And this carries straight through into chapter 4. From this point forward, if you aren't dying at least 200 times per level, you are some kind of gaming god and I bow to your might. At this point, you may be wondering why exactly anyone would subject themselves to die hundreds of times per level 
just to watch other people also experience anxiety-inducing issues. And a lot of that comes down to the unfailingly kind and gentle way that Celeste encourages you as the player. This game walks the very delicate balance of getting you to understand the feeling of hopelessness that Madeline experiences without causing you, the player, to succumb to that feeling yourself. And it does this in a number of ways. One of the simplest ways it does this is by marking your checkpoints per screen. The vast majority of the time, your next checkpoint is always visible to you. You can die on a screen a dozen times, but you only need to make it to the end of the screen once and your progress is saved. Even if you then proceed to immediately die afterward, you've still gotten to the next screen. Another way it does this is by explicitly giving you, the player, words of encouragement. At one point, the game tells you to be proud of your death count. The more you die, the more you're learning. And that's really good to hear, because that must mean I'm learning a hell of a lot. But I think the best way it handles this is when it indirectly gives you encouragement through Madeline. While there are several instances of this happening, my favorite occurs on the last screen of the DLC chapter, Farewell. This is the longest single screen in the entire game, requiring more than two minutes of perfect play. No matter how good you are at the game, this screen will take you a very long time. After dying a few dozen times, Madeline pops out just to check up on Madeline. Just a few more tries. You can do this. And suddenly, all the frustration you're feeling starts to wash away. But back to the main game. At the end of Chapter 4, Madeline and Theo ride a very precarious gondola across a gorge in the mountain. A gondola which happens to stall right in the middle. Suspended. Hundreds of feet in the air. Unable to do anything, Madeline loses control and has a panic attack. I really like the detail that Madeline is just sitting there, not acknowledged by Madeline or Theo, but the fear that she represents in Madeline feels oppressive, overwhelming her from both sides as the horrifying synths in the music overtake the calm piano. Having gone through many a panic attack myself, I can confirm that this music sounds like what a panic attack feels like. Luckily, Theo is there to calm Madeline's breathing. He teaches her a trick. Imagine a feather in front of you. Your breathing keeps the feather afloat. You need to steady your breathing to steady the feather. This is a pretty simple technique, all things considered, but I myself have found use in this trick since I first played the game. It's not flawless by any means, and it doesn't always work, but it certainly helps. Chapter 5 is when the mountain pulls out all the stops, throwing all your anxieties at you. After Madeline follows Theo into a dark temple, the two of them are brought into a mirror world and face the embodiments of that which they fear, forced to self-reflect. From Madeline's subconscious sprout the dark, labyrinthine maze, as well as Madeline to echo her feelings of self-doubt. From Theo's subconscious sprout eyes in all directions that are laser-focused on him, alluding to his reliance on social media and desire to gain followers. Additionally, something very poetic happens to the music after entering the mirror. The first thing you may notice is that the music track is reversed from what was playing at the beginning of the level, literally mirrored, but keep listening and you hear a voice. Play the track backwards and you realize the voice is of Lena Rain, the composer of the game, speaking as Madeline, voicing her fears.
Making it through the temple requires both of you to confront your anxiety. While it can often feel like you are suffering alone, you aren't, and accepting help from trusted friends can often help you overcome it. While the exact nature of your suffering and the degree to which you feel it will be unique for everyone, they'll understand and sympathize with what you're going through more than you may think. After the grueling slog that was Chapter 5, Madeline decides in the beginning of Chapter 6 that she needs to take care of the battle line situation. And she does this by deciding to abandon Battleline, to pretend she isn't there. Remember, Battleline is part of Madeline. For all intents and purposes, Battleline is Madeline. There's no getting rid of her. Battleline fights back in a bit of self-preservation, sending Madeline into another panic attack, and she falls to her lowest point. After much reflection, and an intense boss fight, Madeline finally comes to realize that she can't outrun Madeline, and she can't destroy her either. She needs to accept herself for who she is. All of herself. Even the parts she's not proud of. This is represented in-game with a power-up, Scott Pilgrim style. By accepting Madeline as part of herself, Madeline gains an additional dash. Scott earned the power of self-respect. With this, Madeline is ready for the final push. Right out the gate, the music in Chapter 7 is hyping you up, telling you that you can conquer this mountain. Yes, you fell down, but you've also improved. Your retread through the old areas feels less like a forced reset, and more like a parade celebrating just how much you've accomplished. The music shapes into more determined overlays of the previous songs you've heard. You will conquer the mountain this time. Madeline and Badeline are still not wholly confident, but they're now working in tandem rather than against each other, shoring up each other's shortcomings and insecurities. When you accept every part of yourself, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. My favorite moment in the music track happens when you reach 3,000 meters, just after you get through the Mirror Temple a second time. The music kicks back into high gear as if to tell you, Alright, you made it back to where you fell from. Now let's do this. 3,000 meters also introduces my favorite mechanic, the checkpoint flags. Starting here, a countdown starts from 30. Your goal is no longer to make it all the way to the next screen, you just need to make it to the next flag. And oh boy, is it satisfying to make it to the next flag. Each time you do, you're rewarded with confetti, getting one flag closer to the summit. Every new flag reached feels like having dopamine injected directly into your brain. Even when you get frustrated, you know that you're too close to give up now. know you can overcome it. And then, after hours of gameplay, thousands of deaths, and untold levels of frustration, you do it. It's quiet. Serene. You're given as much time as you want just to savor the summit. Madeline overcame her self-imposed challenge of climbing a mountain and came out of it better understanding, appreciating, and accepting herself. And I think that's kind of beautiful. <laughs>